have a couple of different things uh, today that are probably competing for that label of top story. And what we'll do is we'll break it up by each hour and and concentrate on that. And I have some guests coming by today, too, as well. In fact, I'd like to mention in a few minutes we'll be joined by some people from St. Edward the Confessor School. They have a fundraiser coming up on February 28th, and uh, they'd like to invite people to take part in that. And it really helps support an alternative in education and really a, a, a system of education that might be very rigorous compared to what a lot of young people would get otherwise. They're coming along in about 10 minutes. They'll be joining us on the program. Also, Steve Millington from the Twin Falls County Republicans. Uh, Steve, of course, the chairman of the county party, will join us a little later in the hour, and he has a lot to talk about today. Lots of new taxes being bandied about to pay the bills in Boise. He'll be talking with us about those, and, and many of them are going to be obviously very, very controversial. So we'll touch base with him. And then in the next hour, uh, briefly, just after 9.30 news, or not, yeah, 9.30 break, well, we could do news if you liked it. Uh, if you, you know, if, if you demand it, we'll figure out a way to do it. But we're going to be joined by a fellow who used to be on the Top Gear TV show when it was on NBC. And apparently that got canceled uh, because unlike the British version, the guys on NBC were usually sober while they were doing the program. And he now has a carpentry show. And he's going to be talking with us about the upcoming Home and Garden Show, of which, of course, we here at News Radio 1310 KLIX are a sponsor of. So he'll be joining us a little later in the program, too, as well. He'll be joining us by telephone from an undisclosed location. But you can expect to see him at the show this weekend. So I hope you can stick around for that. His name is Eric Stormer, by the way, and some of you may remember him from his various TV shows. And the other thing I want to talk about, at least off the top this morning, very, very quickly, if we could, while you were sleeping, this story was breaking and it was getting quite a bit of attention all over uh, Western media, that is, at least in the United States. Federal judge halts Obama amnesty, White House to appeal. Now, you've been hearing over the last few days that these evil Republicans are holding up funding for the Department of Homeland Security, which is, I guess, the United States version of the old KGB or the Cheka or the NKVD. Uh, you know, the, the, the secret police organization that was established after 9-11. And we're being told the liberals who never liked it are now angry that it's not being funded by Republicans. But what they're not saying is Republicans have agreed to fund it. They weren't just uh, going to go along, though, and fund that portion about amnesty for illegal aliens, which was going to kick in tomorrow. You know, we'll, we'll end the deportations and ensure that these people register Democrat by the end of the week. Yes. Well, the president of the United States, he represents a co-equal branch of the government. He is not ruling by fiat, even though he seems to think he is. And many of his enablers in establishment media believe the same thing. So when he issued an executive order saying he was going to wave a fig leaf and make a great many of these people citizens, it was very alarming. That's why you've got a holdup, because the Republicans in the House of Representatives said, no, we will not at least approve that portion of funding for DHS. And now all of a sudden the liberals love the Department of Homeland Security, uh, pressing Americans now for at least 15 years. They are now on board uh, with that, and they think that we should have this amnesty and open borders and all of these other things. They've been screaming and yelling about that, but in the meantime, it may now be irrelevant. This is from Stephen Dinan at the Washington Times this morning. A federal judge late Monday halted President Obama's deportation amnesty, ruling he overstepped his powers in trying to grant legal status and benefits and privileges to millions of illegal immigrants in a stunning decision that chides the president. It throws the White House's plans into disarray just a day before applications were to be accepted. And here's a comment from the judge. He said, he said that the DHS itself labels as legal presence. That's all you'd need, right? Legal presence. Is that's what they were saying. If you were here, you had a legal presence. And he responded, in fact, the law mandates that these illegally present individuals be removed. He also went on to say that there's no need in one way or another to go ahead with this because he said no one has really followed the law for the last five years anyway. <laughs> so his point was nobody's going to be upset, nobody's going to be deported by the looks of things just because he stops amnesty in its tracks because there has not been a concerted effort in this country to move people out of here. In fact, a couple of summers ago we brought them here by the train loads, which is why we have a measles outbreak and some of these other situations we're dealing with now. The judge also went on to say the Department of Homeland Security may continue to prosecute or not prosecute these illegally present individuals as current laws dictate. This has been the status quo for at least the last five years, and there is little to no basis to conclude that harm 
will fall upon the defendants if it is temporarily prohibited from carrying out the program. Ultimately, what we're going to get, and it's been a long time coming, executive orders, the first ones were issued by George Washington back in uh, the very first uh, presidency in this country, way back in the 1700s. However, Washington's executive orders, and, and the belief was among those early framers of the Constitution, these were orders that he issued for the executive branch. In other words, he was sitting at the top of his office and he had some people working around him. Unlike President Obama thinks, they were not yet in the White House. But if the office needed paper or the office needed ink, Washington would issue an executive order saying, go buy some. He did not issue blanket orders that said he ruled by fiat. In other words, it was like, well, go buy it. You know, we need to have some correspondence. We'll need the pen and the paper. And he would send people out to do that, and that would be done. That was how executive orders were originally envisaged. Now, when you hear the folks on the left saying, well, you know, the Washington has did it, and everybody else has done it ever since then, they're not explaining that little bit of background. Michael Perutka, who runs the Institute uh, on the Constitution, or for the Constitution, uh, I was at a, a presentation he did. You may see him occasionally on Fox News and some other places where he pops up and makes appearances. But he explained that, that that executive order pertains only to the executive branch. Any other order beyond that is unconstitutional. So here we are, 239 years later, since the founding of this country, and we may finally get some sort of court ruling because if Obama's White House does appeal this, and it goes up the chain of command all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which, by the way, does not serve the president. You may have just heard the Larry Arn a few minutes ago in that spot from, uh, from uh, a Hillsdale College saying, the president is not the boss. It is a co-equal government. The courts, and then Congress, and then the president. Nobody is more powerful than the other one in that three. So the courts will have the final say on this. And if it makes it all the way to the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court finally issues a ruling on executive orders clarifying that, well, God bless them. It'll be good for the country. It'll be good in the long run. You will not see tomorrow bus loads or train loads of illegal immigrants being carted out of the United States just because this thing has been delayed. But if I'm sure if you were to turn on MSDNC right now, ah! yes, they'll be screaming and yelling that the sky is falling. And no matter where you go, looking at either uh, ESPN or not ESPN, excuse me. Well, may, they may jump on board too as well. They're fairly liberal over there. I've got some friends who work behind the scenes. And they tell me some things that, you know, the, the, the regular public doesn't get to see. CNN, uh, the Clinton News Network, MSDNC, and all of the major East Coast newspapers are going to be blithering on about this today and about how it is so awful and inhumane. And if we would just eliminate borders and you as American taxpayers take care of all of these people for perpetuity, wouldn't the world be a much, much better place? So I think that we're, we're, we're under, at least those of us who keep clear-headed about this and think about it logically and think in the terms of uh, a law and order, and you cannot, we are a nation of laws and not of men, you cannot look at it any other way. If you're a lefty, lefty gets up in the morning and lefty says, well, I think this would be good today, so let's do this. And uh, he doesn't worry. Regardless of what the law or the Constitution says, lefty's just going to go ahead and do it. And that's a fungible document to them. And it's whatever they feel like on a particular day. 8.15. You're up next with Bill Colley on Top Story 23 at our studios. And welcome to News Radio 1310 KLIX. Uh, get your facts straight uh, because... Um, yes, I'm a dumb, dumb, dummy. Everyone understands that now after a month and a half. Yeah, well, that's always on the first day, but... Um, Why is it you struggle, by the way, with English so much on the air? Listen, what, why don't you worry about what I'm about to say, not the way I say it, would you? Well, I can barely yeah. understand it, yeah, that's well, why. Well, 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 what do you want? I this want is, people in the United States to speak clear English so we can all understand what they're saying. Citizen. What do you want? Well, then why can't you speak the language? Well, why don't you just get your head out of your butt? Oh, well, that's a very good comeback. I'd say that uh, if he was going to say anything intelligent, he just lost on that particular count. Get your facts straight. The fact straight is, is that they want to overwhelm the system. They want to break down the system, and they, they want to break down those borders as well. And, and I'm sorry, but we're not going to stand and allow that to happen. And I think that the, the fact of the matter is, if you survey the American people, 
And that clown thinks that they're all, as he says, he's smarter than everybody else. Because remember what he said a couple of weeks ago, he went to USC and he got a political science degree. A political science degree in $2 might get you a cup of coffee. I have a similar degree. And let me tell you, it didn't open a whole heck of a lot of doors. I had to kick them down to get where I am today. Secondly, if he went to college in California, he's well aware that the rest of us paid for it. Because he sure as heck didn't. They, they just uh, throw money around in that particular state. And it's really in every state. But they throw other people's money around. And, and they take advantage. People come out of college and they think somehow that, they've, uh, that, 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 that they did it all on their own. Well, okay, they may have studied hard and spent some time in the library and maintained a C average. But most of the bills were paid by people like you and me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, young people don't seem to understand that. My own college experience was very similar. I have to admit it. Uh, they were throwing money, the government, at me left and right. And my dad and mom both worked for a living. So I went out and bought a new customized uh, a Dodge Tradesman 200 van. There's a piece at our Facebook page about that if you'd like to take a read on it and get some more details. But all of these people who say, your facts are all wrong, you're dead wrong. There's nothing factually in error about what I'm talking about. The President of the United States cannot rule by fiat. People who come here in the holds of trucks or in tunnels or sneaking in any other back door know they are breaking the law. And we are a nation, again, ruled by laws. And not by some emperor who has self-appointed himself to make these decisions about what is right and wrong. It's as simple as that. Coming up on 819, Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning. I want to point out in a couple of minutes, on a lighter note, well, it's a serious cause because we're talking about educating young people. But it's on a, on a lighter note, at least, than perhaps this issue, and maybe not quite so contentious. We're going to be talking with some people dropping by from uh, St. Edward the Confessor School, which is affiliated with the church, of course, in uh, downtown Twin Falls, and has been educating young people for a great many, many years. And these people come out of, usually with a, with a Roman Catholic education, or really any Christian school, tends to crank out students who are usually leagues ahead of everyone else. They go off to college and they don't have to have two years of remedial education before they get into the real meat of things. Uh, they don't necessarily major in political science either. <laughs> they tend to focus on the hard sciences because they've actually already learned that complexity while they were, while they were in school at, at, at their own institutions. But it's not easy because as a parent, you know, you're paying for everybody else's education in the public system, and then you have to really pay twice if you'd like to educate your child in a Christian, and in this case, Roman Catholic school. More details coming up. Bill Colley with you this morning. 24 at our studios. LIX 13. Top story. We have some guests in the studio with us, and we'll be getting them in just a moment. But I, I do quickly want to mention, tomorrow I have some guests coming by from Western States Bus Services. And currently, if you have an interest in maybe making a few extra dollars by driving a school bus, Western States is hiring part-time drivers, split shifts five days per week, summer's off, most people would appreciate that, and scheduled no school days, pay us $10.75 per hour. Apply today by contacting 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. Speaking of schools and education, I have a couple of people who are joining me in studio because they have a big event coming up a week from, uh, a week from Saturday, and uh, it's one of the highlights of their year. They're here from St. Edward the Confessor School, uh, right in downtown Twin Falls. And, of course, we're joined by Allie Paleo. She is the uh, the school principal. And uh, and the other name, we had to talk about this earlier, it's Swiss. Mm-hmm, yeah. It's, uh, and, and, and pronounce that again for me. Halfliger. It's one of the more popular names in Switzerland, I'm told. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like Smith in Switzerland. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the first name <laughs> Not again Not around is? here, though. Diana. Diana. So Diana's working as well, helping with this effort at this fundraiser. Uh Let's begin with the 28th. Where is this going to be taking place at? I don't know which one of you wants to open up with this. Um, I will. Um, it's going to be at the St. Edward's Church Parish Hall. So it's right across the street from the church there. Um, we used to have it at the at the hall when I was a student at St. Edward's many years ago. <laughs> and so we decided to bring it back there again, bring it back home. And, uh, and I was going to say, it's not a small place. I mean, there's a lot of room and there's a tremendous amount of parking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, yep. a, there's a three or four different parking areas right around the uh, church and the school, from what I understand. Yeah, there is. So there'll be room for everybody. 
What time do you start? It's going to be, uh, there's going to be a cocktail hour at five, and that's when the bidding starts on the silent auctions. Trip to Hawaii somewhere in there, right? Yeah, that's part of our reverse raffle. So that goes on all <laughs> night. The last person to be drawn out of 300 tickets um, wins a trip to Hawaii. So, and there's a, some consolation prizes in there, a weekend in Seattle, a week, uh, evening at Cactus Pete's, um, an overnight stay in Sun Valley. So... A lot, a lot of giveaways. And and uh, you, you cost the cost is what? Uh, it's gonna be fifth uh, for the raffle. It's no, for a, the for the dinner actually. For the dinner, it's gonna be fifty dollars a plate, and that's a prime rib dinner. Ooh. Our caterers are um, the CSI Culinary Arts Department, so they're very excited about um, doing the dinner, and they've got a really great menu set up for us. I was going to say, and it's a hundred dollars for the uh, for the to enter the drawings. Exactly. Yep. A hundred dollars per ticket, or you can get um, six for five hundred. You see, some of us actually read the church bulletin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Although sometimes I have None. to ask Benito to explain it to me. Uh, moving over to the school side of things, and uh, getting the principal's viewpoint on all of this. Eight twenty-six right now. Twenty-four is our temperature at our studios at News Radio thirteen ten KLIX. Th- the importance of an education in any Christian school, Roman Catholic as well. I think it cannot be. Uh, understated because students, unlike others who often go to college, don't have to spend their first two years of college in remedial education. (laughs) Exactly. Um, We do a very, very good job of teaching the Catholicism, which is our primary um, job, and then also with the academics. It's smaller class sizes. Uh, We have more time to teach not anywhere near as much testing, although the children, we know where they are by the regular tests that we give, but not the state testing. I I remember a friend of mine telling me years ago, he was a Lutheran, but he was teaching at a a local uh, Roman Catholic school, and he said to me the reason he took that job, he said because when he walked in, he was interviewing, and he was looking at the classrooms above the doorways, there were crucifixes, and he said, when I saw that, he said to myself, or he said to himself, he said, I think I want to be here. He said to, to him, that was a, the, the really important part of this is you do not neglect that in the formation of any child. Exactly. That is the first and foremost, foremost piece that we do. That is the most important piece. And you're right. There are crucifixes above each door. There are crucifixes throughout the building. And there are the statues of our saints, our Blessed Mother, and of uh, Jesus Christ. And, and it's not an easy... Well, for parents who'd like to do this, the reason you have fundraisers is because they're already generally paying school taxes. So yes, they're they paying are. for educations twice. But in order to get children into the school, obviously sometimes you have to have some ability to help them out if parents have that sort of desire. I don't know which one of you wants to handle that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do have to. We do. We have an angel fund, and we also have a, a scholarship program for the Catholic children. And that uh, you can apply for, and that is given to you upon need. But not everyone applies for it, and not everyone um, also receives it if they do apply for it. But we must have these benefit dinners. Uh, particularly, it's a huge fundraiser. It's really our only fundraiser that's this of this magnitude. And it has been well known for 31 years that this is quite the benefit to go to, to help us. We have beautiful projects done by the children that go up for bid. We also have other um, baskets and... Um, items that have been donated to us to go out for bid. Very quickly, if people wanted to get tickets in advance, how would they do that? Um, Call the school at uh, 734-3872, and you can get your tickets there. All right, and there'll be some at the door, I would imagine, too, right? We're, yeah, we'll have a couple, but we're going to try to sell them all beforehand. You want that idea Mm -hmm. how many people you're going to have there. Right, yeah. Well, I want to thank the two of you for coming by today. Thank you. And I wish you great luck with this. This this sounds like a lot of fun and for a very good cause. Steve Millington coming up with us in just a few minutes on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Ooh, well, that's a music for summertime right there, but we're not quite to summer yet, although certainly we've been dealing with some spring like temperatures lately. We'll take that. I'm looking up at our monitor here on the uh, on to the right, and it's a shows an icy fountain in New York City. They can have it. You know, you figure if there's a corollary here, that in all these places where it's bitterly cold and snowing this winter, 
They all are run by Democrats. Think about that for a moment. In places, places where Republicans are in charge, we've had really mild weather, uh, such as here in Idaho. Steve Millington enjoyed that. Uh, he is in the studio with us. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Good to be here. I'm, I'm glad that the Republicans can get something accomplished that's successful and well-received. The- <laughs> that's that old George Bush weather machine yeah. that they used to have in the basement oh, of the White House. Oh, man, oh, man. <laughs> 8.34 on our program. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, newsradio1310.com. We have 24, but our weather is going to be a lot warmer today than it is in other parts of the country. And, of course, Steve comes by to warm things up, too, once a week. Uh, We we were talking before the show via email. Right. Good golly. A lot of things going on. Well, you see, we're we're about halfway through the uh, legislative session in, in Idaho. Typically, they like to hold it to about 90 days. So by the end of March, they want to be pretty much wrapped up with this legislative session. And and we're halfway there. So it's it we're getting down to the uh, uh, knuckle busting here. How do we get some of these things resolved? We got two or three real uncomfortable issues, <clears throat> especially this year, that uh, are kind of carryovers from previous years. Um, one that's really a, 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 a black eye, and that's this uh, state payment for the uh, Idaho Education Network broadband connection. That was a fiasco and a failure and. And, and it has great uh, uh, application, but, you know, they just they, they put it together with the wheels on backwards, and, and it's come back to get them. <clears throat> I visited with a fellow yesterday, actually yesterday uh, uh, morning at uh, in, in the, the Magic Valley area, Twin Falls and Jerome, Senator Crapo was here, and I attended one of his uh, town hall meetings. And, and afterwards, uh, uh, me and another fellow were standing visiting, and he said, you know, um, there are ways to accomplish this broadband connection thing that could be done very, very comfortably if we would just take off the blinders and start looking at things a little bit more um, outside the box. And and he suggested one of the things that happens a great deal is the College of Southern Idaho, as well as North Idaho College and College of Western Idaho, have these uh, data centers where they... Uh, have dual credit classes that go to networking to all schools, not all of them, but all who want to get online. And I said, wait a minute, why couldn't we just dovetail this this uh, uh, internet stuff right on top of this connection to the local junior colleges? The networks are not entirely covering the entire state, but mostly covering the entire state. We could just dovetail them through the three community colleges sure. and let them admit. And, and he said, well, yeah, I don't see any reason why we couldn't. It would take a little bit of exploratory work and a little bit of imagination and, and think outside the box, but it could be done. And I thought to myself, why is it we always think we have to reinvent something or create, quote, a brand new agency? What the heck's wrong with just getting things done? I heard a good uh, comment from Randy Staples yesterday. He said some of the school districts will just simply go with their local <coughs> providers. Providers. He said maybe that was the way to go in the first place. And, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good idea. It does. It is um, open to some difficulties. Uh, last week, uh, Thursday night, I was in Mountain Home visiting with some Republicans there, and and uh, we just they did they informed me that. Uh, in order to hook up the elementary school and the middle school to the same network that their high school has, the costs are going to be almost double. And I thought, well, that's a little bit interesting. Why would the the uh, additional hookups be so much more money? Well, because the schools themselves were not properly prepared to handle that. And I said, oh, so that's basically, I refer to it as an infrastructure problem rather than a commu- uh, communications problem. So it's a, kind of a one-time fix, and then they go online, and away they go. Well, <clears throat> I'm still an advocate of the best source of spending tax money, as at the lowest is at the lowest levels. Let the school districts handle it at the school district levels. They will be more efficient. They answer directly to a constituency who is right close by. And you see them at the coffee shop and at the grocery store and at your local church and in the community, and and they're more responsive. So let's bring it back to the local level and take care of it. 
That problem's not going to go away. Uh, it's going to have some dislocations and some interruptions before it gets resolved. And that's, that's going to be a real headache for, uh, for the rest of this school year because it comes, number one, so late in the school year, and we're having to do a crash planning program to get through till graduation time this spring. It concerns me, too, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the way that perhaps contracts were let. We just saw a governor get toppled in Oregon because of the way contracts were let, and that's we, we can get back to that not, perhaps a bit later. But. Not, not, not funny. I, I read those articles as well as you did in the newspaper and so forth, and I said to myself, whoa, this is not a good thing. More coming up with Steve Millington on the program in just a couple of minutes. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We could be seeing an increase in the sales tax too, as well. Uh, we'll be delving into that in just a couple of minutes. We, uh, we have a, a story from the Associated Press today, and I was sitting here chatting with Steve Millington, and I think this really sums up how media can tend to, uh, even even they don't understand it. They don't sometimes realize their own bias in the way they report a story. You're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. This is Top Story with Bill Colley, 24 at 844 this morning. So here's the story from uh, the uh, the second news minute from Idaho Associated Press. And uh, the writer says, the Idaho House is considering a new transportation funding bill seeking to raise almost $200 million per year to maintain Idaho's, and I circle this, crumbling roads and bridges. Now, that is a judgment because a lot of the roads I'm driving on are not crumbling. And it just it shows you every time you read something like that, some people believe the roads are in deep need of repair. But crumbling is making an assertion across the board. And it just shows you sometimes, I think, how media follows along with this notion that we need to keep taxing people till they they just don't have anything left to pay. Well, they want to build a bias into their article. So, and, and I don't know where they come up with that, except that the, the, the shock factor gets people's attention and they say, you know, our roads are crumbling. Well, not yet. But keep in mind that if we spend $1 in preventive maintenance, that's the equivalent of $8 in new construction. So we need to maintain our, our, our infrastructure roads, in this case, and, and make sure that it's adequate and sufficient for the state of Idaho. Um, everything that we grow and produce and process in the state of Idaho is shipped out of here. Uh, some on rail, most on road, trucks. And everything that we consume here comes in. Let's keep those things adequate and current and functional. Otherwise, we're going to suffer. Now, let's go back to figuring out how we're going to pay for this. Um, there was an article in the in the newspaper that showed up, I, I think, yesterday, perhaps. They want to add a one cent sales tax, increase our sales tax by 1% from 6 to 7. And that will generate somewhere in the neighborhood of 175 to $200 million a year. And we can just earmark that for Department of Transportation spending. And that will help to mitigate this uh, deficiency in, in uh, funding. Um, okay, fine. No, it ain't. And, and the thing that bothers me is that it seems to be okay for the legislators to just say, well, we're going to raise the rate from 6% to 7%, and it will generate this much money. Um, now, this is where we pr probably will get a lot of phone calls from diehard Republicans, and they're going to want to tar and feather me. <clears throat> there was a, a, an uh, item proposed, and I would say within the last four or five years. It was proposed by a Democratic lawmaker, uh, so, you know, strike one. But the, the concept was if we eliminated the some, not all, but some of the exemptions in the sales tax law in the state of Idaho and, and made all of these transactions subject to sales tax, it would generate somewhere in the neighborhood of $300 million a year. And, and th at that point in time, the, the objective of the lawmaker was we can use this money to fund uh, the, the deficiency or the shortfalls in education, and we could use it in other uh, social uh, uh, programs. Um, it didn't get any sounding bite or any hearing of any kind in the state of Idaho. And if I remember right, uh, the, uh, in, in uh, conjunction with that proposal, we would reduce the effective sales tax rate from 6% to 5 and still generate that much additional revenue. So I'm asking the question, why don't we just go back and look at all of these exemptions 
to the sales tax and eliminate many of them. We don't, you know, they, what, what, what purpose do they serve except for preferential industries, perhaps? Let's eliminate them. Leave the tax rate at 6%, still generate our $200 million for uh, highway uh, uh, improvement and infrastructure. Why is that that the first thing they want to do is raise the tax rather than look at the applicability of where the tax is being administered? Now, that idea, if it had been recommended by a Republican, might have gotten some traction, right? Uh, well, that's why I said I'm going to get tarred and feathered <laughs> because it, it may have done exactly that. Now, I had some business experience uh, in the last uh, of recent past four, five, six years where we were doing some business in South Dakota. And, and we went up there and bought uh, some farm machinery. And then one of the pieces we bought was a tractor run about 200 grand. And, and uh, in Idaho, there is no sales tax on, on th that kind of production uh, at equipment. But there was in South Dakota. But it was only 2%. Now, the actual rate on everything else in South Dakota was 4 Now, I don't know what it is currently. These are dated numbers, okay? But we paid 4% on everything else. We paid 2% on the purchase of our, our uh, uh, production equipment, agricultural equipment. But there was no personal income tax and no corporate income tax. So I look at this thing and I say to myself, wait a minute, maybe we could, could relook, rethink the sales tax procedure, eliminate all of these exemptions, and have a sales tax rather than income taxes. Now, yesterday, uh, Senator Crapo, in, in his town hall meetings, made the comment that uh, somebody asked him about, well, what do you think about a national sales tax? And he said, I don't want to call it a national sales tax. I'd prefer to call it a consumption tax. But he said, I think it would be a grand idea. However, we either have A, income taxes, or B, a consumption slash right. sales tax. One or the other. But not both. We do not have both. And he said, if we put in a, a, a national consumption sales tax, then we have a constitutional amendment that says no income tax, period. And so I look at it and I say to myself, well, why couldn't we make that applicable in Idaho? Let's eliminate the income tax. We'll put everything on a sales tax basis. And then the stronger our state becomes, the more resourceful and, and better financially prepared we are to address the needs of the future. And we're not piggybacking the thing or burdening Everybody with income ta taxes, we do it with sales taxes, and and uh, you know the the idea of, of just in just across the board raise the, the uh, sales tax rate from six to seven, and the, yeah that'll raise two hundred million dollars and that helps to take care of the uh, transportation shortfalls, and and frankly um, we we have too much money for we raise too much tax money and put it in the wrong places every day of the week. Transportation issues, uh, you know, you can't get to the store and buy a gallon of milk unless you get on a road. And if those roads fall apart in your face, um, that drink of milk is, or, or your soda pop or your loaf of bread is going to be a real burden. So let's keep these things updated and current and useful. So that, that's one area where we need to spend some tax money. I think we may have a caller with okay. us. I think it may be a very, very patient caller waiting the last couple of minutes. And uh, you'd be on the air right now at 851 and 25 at our studios on News Radio 1310 KLIX with Steve Millington. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, where do they get this data about the roads falling apart? I'm all over <laughs> southern Idaho. I don't see a big problem you know, uh, with the roads. You know, that, that is an excellent, excellent observation. Um, in, in the past uh, several weeks, we have traveled to uh, um, uh, Weezer and to Boise and to uh, Homedale and to uh, uh, Pocatello and Idaho Falls and Rexburg and uh, Mountain Home. And yeah, our roads are in good shape. I think part of the problem is that they, they do engineering studies and, and many of these engineering studies... Uh, uh, have uh, assumed useful lives. <laughs> and, and this is particularly true with bridges and structures. And, and so we have got many, many, many um, structures, bridges, let's call them, and, and that's a broad definition, if you will, please, that are going to need uh, update or replacement or correction. And those are the things that they're looking at that saying we are so woefully far behind. 
Now, uh, just a little sidebar. Uh, the uh, Idaho Department of Transportation issued contracts within the last week or two to do some work on the Bob Barton Lex Leland Road that goes from Buell over to Wendell. And, and they've got two or three uh, uh, crossings of little coolies, uh, canals we kind of call them, that are going to have to be corrected. And then they're going to put a, 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 a turn at the uh, intersection of Bob Barton and Lex Leland and, and turn that into a, a, a Y a circular arrangement. Some people would say, well, we really don't need to do that. But if you go over there and just sit on the corner of the road and watch, you'd be surprised at how much traffic there is goes across that particular intersection all day long. And, and uh, many of the, the, the bridges over these canals are 50, 60 years old. They're just waiting to collapse. Now, you get on the freeways, they are in much better shape. You get onto the secondary roads, and you do have some problems. You get onto county-administered roads, and it's not uncommon at all to have some potholes and some difficulties, some washboards, and, and those are the things. Today it's a washboard. Tomorrow we have got it rutted, and then we have to replace it. So the, the caller makes a, a good, a very astute observation they don't appear to be that bad. And for the most part, I, I'm the same way. I don't think they're all that bad. Um, I, in the, the new world, you can get on the freeway and set your cruise at 80, and, and uh, you can't go to sleep. Right. But, you might. But, but you, you, can, you can travel in relative comfort because our roads are in good shape. The thing we want to make sure is that they don't become degraded by lack of attention. I think we have time for one more call. Okay, caller. let's get them. Uh, let's see if we've got someone still here waiting on hold. Uh, you're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX with Steve Millington and Bill Colley. Good morning. I, I know that we have to project into the future, and that's usually what they're doing. But freeways and stuff is not the state's problem. Um, but I want to know how come everything turns into a tax increase instead of trying to find the pork that's doing nothing and using it for something that's good. You know, that is uh, you spend a little bit of time analyzing political situations. That's a very good comment. Why do we, uh, that, and, and that's my biggest concern with this one cent uh, increase in sales taxes to fund transportation department. The first answer to everything is raise the taxes. Let's not figure out how to do it better. Let's not figure out how to do it uh, different from it's been done in the past. Let's not find a new way to do it. Let's not think outside the box. That's against the law. You're in the box, stay in the box, and do as you're told. And, and sometimes it takes a great deal of uh, uh, personal resolve to just say, hey, wait a minute, this is a bad idea. We, we can do this. We have another alternative, another answer to this issue. Has anybody considered this? Now, I've got half an idea in the back of my mind why the legislators uh, do not want to attack the uh, exemptions from sales tax. Every one of those exemptions has at least one or two lobbyists behind it who will scream to high heaven. You know, I didn't get taxed on buying a newspaper on Sunday. And it's, Gee Willikers says somebody in the liberal media doesn't have a sales tax. Um, I think, I'm not sure. But I, I think if you went to the uh, uh, to, to sales register, uh, they ring that up at not two dollars, but a dollar ninety eighty five or something, and the difference is the tax to get it to the two dollar price okay. tag on the. That might make sense. I, I think that's the way they do that. But you're, you're right, and uh, every time we start talking about this sales tax thing, I, I'm drawn back to the experience we had back there in the South Dakota, and I say to myself, why in the world can't we do something like that? Uh, uh, you know, for crying out loud, at least explore it and look at it. That you wouldn't have to do too much uh, uh, digging because this proposal, and, and I can't remember the individual's name who proposed it, the uh, uh, Democrat lawmaker, but uh, they went through and did a lot of uh, real serious detailed stuff. And they had a list of about 25, 30 items. If we eliminated the exemption, we would generate this much of additional tax revenues to the state of Idaho. And I looked at it and I said, well, if we eliminated all of the exemptions and made everything subject to tax, then we could eliminate personal income tax, corporate income tax, who knows what else we could get rid of. 
and, and make our life more simplified. Now, for a long time, um, I tried to talk to the revenue tax people and the transportation people. Let's just, we need a 10 cent a gallon gas tax. Let's put it in. Let's put it in right now. Uh, gasoline prices are going to go up between now and June. We could just bury the sales tax in tie, inside of the market-driven price increases, and most people would never see it. Well, boy, that got nowhere. Got to say thank you again. You know, this time, <laughs> my, how time flies when we're having fun. Remember, the uh, Twin Falls County Lincoln Day Banquet, February 28th, a week Canyon Saturday. Crest. That's a week from Saturday. We're getting a real good response to tickets. We've got a lot of our state people are going to be there. We're going to have a really good time. And uh, quickly, the website is? Um, TwinFallsRepublican.com, I think. Yes, TwinFallsRepublicans.com. All right. Grant Love's coming up in just a couple of minutes with us right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And news as well from Fox at 9 o'clock. We have, a, we have a guest with us uh, in this segment of the program, and of course he's a monthly regular with us. That's Grant Loves. He is the a prosecutor here in Twin Falls County and uh, takes some time out just to talk with us about some various legal issues from time to time. Uh, first of all, we should mention we are warming up ever so slightly this morning. It's still not like back east where everything we're seeing is uh, nothing but icebox, but we're at 26 right now on our way to a high perhaps in the lower 50s before the day is out. Seven minutes after 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. On News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Uh, first of all, welcome back. Thank you. It's good always good when a guest comes back after I visit with them the first time. Well, you know, it's early yet. <laughs> you still might have some people that refuse to come back uh, after the second time. <laughs> the, uh, well, when you're across the room, you can't tell about the halitosis, so that usually keeps people coming back, uh, unless they sit over here at this table. R right off the top, though, on a more serious matter. Because of your role prosecuting cases, there are only certain limits about what you can talk about during an ongoing case. Uh, but we Correct. were talking off air. Um, we had the first homicide of the year. I think it's the first of the year take place last Friday. And we've already had some arrests made with that. But we were talking off air about how sometimes you see the stories of these people who get involved in these issues and they decide to rob someone. It goes poorly. And yet the only money they would have gotten might have gotten them through a weekend or a couple of weeks and and often they spend that in a bar or somewhere and what motivates people to throw away their lives for a few dollars like that which is a very temporary thing in many cases well as with any uh complex uh human interaction you know when when somebody is engaged in a crime there are all kinds of motivations uh uh, some of them intentional and pre-planned and some of them just happen when the situation unfolds um, with regard to some of them, uh, and, and you know the the type of incident you're talking about, where you know somebody is being robbed, um, obviously there there is often a case where the people that are involved are using drugs or maybe alcohol, and so they're not thinking clearly. But I think the biggest problem often is people just have very short term you know goals. Uh, they don't think ahead. Uh, they don't think that they're going to be caught. They don't think that if they're caught. You know, it's going to matter. They think I can get this now, and and they they try to take care of the immediate need without thinking the consequences. And I think uh, you know, with regard to property crimes, that's often the case. Whether somebody's you know shoplifting at a store or um, you know stealing from the company they work for or something like that. I mean, it's almost never the case that somebody uh, is risking you know prison for a life-changing amount of money. It's usually a fairly small amount of money, which maybe they can use to gamble for a couple of nights in jackpot or, you know, buy a thing they wanted to buy or, you know, obviously a lot of times use it on drugs. But uh, it's rarely uh, what you would call a life-changing amount. And so, yeah, you think, what's the, what's the mindset behind that? I think it has to be um, pretty short-term. And in so many cases, I think in this day and age, people who, who are involved in committing various crimes do not even realize that, for instance, after they leave the area or if they try to leave the area, they leave a record of themselves with this uh, thing called a cell phone, uh, which is easy to track. Or if they use a, a card, a credit card or something, they, they, you, can, you can follow someone down the road, basically, even if they go out of state or across the state. 
and it's not very difficult to do any longer. And people, obviously, you're right. They think short term, and they don't think through anything that they're doing. Right, and and it's especially true with uh, things like uh, embezzlement. And you know, I mean, there's a there's a paper trail. Um, money just doesn't appear, and then you take it, and then people forget about it. I mean. You know, your employer uh, knows that there was money, and maybe you'll get away with it for a while while they're lax about it. But eventually, some bookkeeper is going to come in, or the police are going to have a forensic accountant look at the books, and it's going to be clear that every time you were at the till, money came up missing, and every time you did the books, money came up missing. So, um, you know, there there are you know people leave tracks, you know, most of the time when they commit a crime. Uh, but they don't think about that when they're doing it. They think, I can solve today's problem by doing this. And I think if they stopped and thought about it, a lot of these things wouldn't happen. And, of course, that assumes that they're in their right frame of mind. If they're, you know, if they're on methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin or something, they're not thinking as you and I would think. Our, our studio guest, Grant Lobes, is uh, joining us this morning. It's uh, coming up on 912-26 at our studios on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio 1310.com and Bill Colley with Top Story. From your perspective, I, I think that there must be some sometimes great satisfaction when you get a conviction of someone who, uh, you know, and, and you bring some closure to the victim's family. But on the other hand, there's got to be a double-edged sword because so many times you've got to be driving home afterwards thinking, why did this have to happen in the first place? Oh, I think that's often true, especially in cases uh, with, you know, victims and, and victims of violence or sex offense cases. You you, uh, you often think um, how terrible it is for the victim and why did such a thing have to happen where this person went through that. Um, on the flip side, of course, there is um, on, on many cases uh, some sympathy for the defendant. Uh, who has messed up their life by foolish choices that they've made. And I would say, you know, the overwhelming majority of people that we prosecute who who violate crime uh, don't do it because they're evil. There are There is a portion of genuinely evil people, um, the people who victimize small children, some of the some of the violent crime, even some of the property crime is just calculated. I'm a bad person, and I'm going to keep taking advantage of people. But a lot of the time, it's uh, it's either desperation or addiction or just stupidity and short sightedness, uh, and you you do feel bad for people who you know cause a life changing damage to themselves by you know one or two activities. On the other hand, we also you know have a lot of people who just continue to come back and never learn their lesson, <laughs> um, and those people you just think, you know. Find something else to do. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of our time in the criminal justice system on a handful of people, and they come back and back and back and back. There used to be, when I used to cover courts 20-some uh, years ago, they would put the calendar outside each courtroom so right. you could come by and read what was going on, and, and that's how I would keep track of who had an appearance that day. So many times I saw names that were so familiar, and sometimes it was families. The entire family just always seemed to be in some sort of trouble. And and there were three or four family names that just were so repetitive. Yeah. Uh, you just you just wondered what had gone haywire in that situation. And that's the case. And and I think, too, um, you know, if you look at studies and you, you look at uh, demographic type studies and studies that talk about you know, the types of crimes that people of certain ages commit— uh, sometimes you'll see, you know, groups of people age out of things. Uh, there, there are a few people that, you know, we used to have, you know, it seemed like on a monthly basis. And after a while, you don't see their names anymore. And either they got older or they learned their lesson or sometimes, obviously, they're in prison, so you don't see them for a while. But, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, there are certain, you know, if, if, if we could cross off, you know, 20, 30 people, you know, uh, we would we would uh, eliminate a lot of the crime in town if they would just uh, see the light and and behave. Well, a lot of those people, because of the background, they don't have a lot of money. Just before we went on air, we were talking with Steve Millington. There's a discussion going on at the state capitol right now about uh, perhaps finding ways to uh, to raise more money for public defenders who, I guess, notoriously, they're not getting a lot of money necessarily for representing certain 
certain clients. And in many, many places around the country, you have to do so much. Each office has to do so much of that work. But uh, it, 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 it's not going to enrich anyone. And some people are claiming that because of that, maybe certain people aren't getting the defense that they actually deserve. Yeah, and of course, that's a, a, a very complex question. But the fact is that most public defender clients uh, get very good representation in this state. Um, the, the standards that there are uh, for public defenders are uniformly higher than the standards for private defense attorneys. Um, for instance, on a death penalty case, a private defense attorney doesn't have, any, have to have any qualifications at all to handle a death penalty case. A public defender has to uh, go through all sorts of uh, requirements to be what they call death penalty qualified. Uh, but, you know, if you hire your own lawyer, it's your choice. You can hire your, your cousin. You can hire your nephew. You can hire anybody. Uh, the public defender's uh, system gets a bad rap because people see how much work they do and they see how much they're paid. The fact is they do the same or slightly less work than the prosecutors do, and they're paid about the same. Uh, they are public employees, and public employees don't go into public uh, jobs to get wealthy. If you want to become wealthy as an attorney, and that isn't as easy as people think it is, you have to be a private attorney or a corporate attorney or you know, go to Wall Street or go to Chicago or something. Uh, in Idaho, the, the, there aren't any prosecutors who are getting rich and there aren't any public defenders who are getting rich. The, the question about the public defense system comes about when you look about the different ways in which different counties handle their obligation. Uh, in Twin Falls and in Ada County, uh, in the bigger cities, we have large public defenders' offices that are very similar and similarly funded to the prosecutors' offices. Uh, in a small county, um, where it, sometimes you might have a part-time prosecutor or one with you know one deputy, uh, you often have contracts that are let out by the county commissioners for local lawyers to do public defense work. And those contracts don't pay that much, but often, often those are part-time jobs as well. So it really is a county-by-county county question as to how that works. Um, the statewide solution to try to solve that statewide, um, if the legislature does that, and I'm not sure they will, uh, will be enormously expensive for, for the taxpayers. I mean, we're talking uh, $50 million expensive. Wow. Uh, and I, I heard uh, Steve Millington and uh, you were talking about fixing roads and so forth. Uh, this would be a huge additional expenditure uh, to fix a problem that is um, fixable through much less expensive methods. I was going to say, uh, uh, for people who uh, do some of this work, though, too, uh, it can later on turn around and be uh, it can be used because I, my experience was covering courts. A lot of the public defenders got their pictures on TV a lot. And eventually when they may leave that office, that actually helped them uh, when they put out the shingle because suddenly everyone knew their names, knew what they looked like. So in some re respects, if they were a younger person, that was how they sometimes got established in the law. Sure, and, that, and that's true of prosecutors too because um, not only do you get your picture in the paper as a public defender and occasionally as a prosecutor, you actually get an enormous amount of experience very quickly. And so um, that that's a double-edged sword too because do you have to break? Yes, we do. Hold on to that thought. Uh, coming up, just a couple more minutes, uh, more with uh, Grant Lopes, talking, of course, about uh, some issues related to the law and, of course, a prosecution uh, a viewpoint, uh, but also as well uh, with many, many years past experience, uh, probably on both sides, we should point that out, too. So usually how the prosecutor starts out is he's working the other side of the, uh, the room. Details ahead, 27 right now at our studios, 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Our guest uh, in this segment of the program, Grant Lopes. Of course, he's the top prosecutor in Twin Falls County, Idaho. And you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 27 at our studios at 924. We've got about five minutes left or so this morning. Uh, I didn't want to cut you off, but of course. Uh, sure. Just you, let me finish you were in the middle of the thought. what I was saying. Uh, you know, because you said that. Uh, it, that in these jobs, public defender jobs and, and prosecutor jobs too, that mm -hmm. you know people can uh, get experience which you know benefits them later, and it does because um, 
prosecutors and public defenders get a lot more trial experience than most lawyers do. And law firms like that. They like somebody who's actually been able to try a case. The, the problem with that is, from, from my point of view and from the public's point of view too, is that often public defenders and prosecutors become the place where you get trained and then as soon as you know what you're doing, you move on. Uh, so it, it means that you know the, the people who are in the job are often relatively new people. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem that we're seeing with some of the complaints about public defender system. Um, I would say, though, that in Twin Falls, that is, it's not a big problem. And in the places in the state where there is a county office like Twin Falls and the bigger counties, uh, they tend to be able to keep people uh, for long enough that they know what they're doing. Um, and fortunately, in, in my office, uh, in my prosecuting attorney's office, we've been able to keep people for, for many years. I, I think the average tenure in my office is 11 or 12 years, and I have a number of people who've been there 15, 16, 17, 18 years, uh, which really increases the amount of productivity you get from that person uh, because, you know, these are difficult jobs, and, and that's part of the complaint about the public defender system is look at these young lawyers, they have all these cases to do. Nobody has this many cases to do. And that's true largely, except obviously prosecutors have that many cases to do. But that's just the nature of the job. You're not going to get somebody with 20 years experience applying to be a rookie public defender. It's just not going to happen. Um, but I think that um, in, in the bigger counties, uh, we do a good job of making it possible for you to have a, a career doing that. And you know, to pay your bills, it, it's just not that you're going to get rich there. It's it, But the institutional memory of having those people around, that's a wonderful thing because the longer someone is in that role prosecuting various cases, they can build on all of this too as well. Right, absolutely. And, and it, it's just as important uh, for a person uh, who's accused of an offense um, or, you know, just a citizen of a county to have a prosecutor that knows uh, what to charge somebody with, when not to charge them, um, what punishment is appropriate and what punishment is excessive uh, because, you know, the prosecutor decides on the charges and, and has so much uh, to do with what uh, we spend our resources on in, in a given county. And so the, the part of prosecution that benefits defendants and benefits citizens who might not be charged with something uh, is often overlooked when we get, you know, the narrow vision of some of the legislators about we've got to fix this public defender system because they're the only people that are defending, you know, the, uh, the innocent. Well, it, my job is primarily to defend the innocent uh, and secondarily to put people in jail who commit crimes because uh, necessarily, you have to make sure that you're charging the people who deserve to be charged. Ed, I was going to say, when you brought up the fact that you've got people sometimes you can retain, one of my best friends is married to a woman who was the chief assistant in her county for appeals. So when they actually appeal a case, that's her work. And she right. goes to the uh, to the state capitol, argues before the, uh, the state court of appeals, and uh, and has been in that role for a good 20, 25 years. Yeah, and as a result, she does a better job for the citizens than she would if she were replaced by somebody who's brand new. And and that's important. And, and I think uh, for both prosecution and public defense, we need to uh, have a system which allows people who want to stay in that job to be able to afford to do it. Uh, and, and I think, by and large, we do uh, in the counties that have full-time offices. Um, and with regard to the other counties, um, both public defense and prosecution are often part-time, and so you can have another job. That means a, a prosecutor is actually perhaps working on some defense cases now and then, too. Well, well. he shouldn't be doing that, but he can be doing civil work. Um, it is legal in Idaho for a prosecutor to work on defense cases, but I think it's a bad idea. Might be a conflict at some point. I think it definitely is, yeah. For, for people, by the way, who do end up in, uh, in the system, and I, I don't know that anyone's ever asked you this question or not. Um, obviously, you, you got to get good representation. you got to look for that immediately. But at, at, at some point, too, um, I think there's a lack of understanding why they get there. I and mean, we talked about this earlier. People just start thinking short term. 
Uh, and I've seen some outbursts in court sometimes that, that lead me to believe that people don't have a sense of, even good people sometimes don't have a sense of contrition. Right. And, and that's got to be a challenge. Uh, we've got we've got to hold that thought, I guess, for the next appearance. Okay. But, but first of all, thank you for coming by again. Mark it down on the list to grill me about that next time. <laughs> yes. Not much of a grilling, but... <laughs> oh, thank you. Nice to be here. All right. Grant Loeb's joining us this morning. Coming up in a few minutes, uh, we've got some news about the uh, Home and Garden show coming up. In fact, we've got Star from Television who's going to be talking about uh, some of the events with that this weekend. Of course, KLIX, uh, your friends at NewsRadio1310.com, joint sponsors of that event. 28 now at our studios. It's 930. One of the greatest tonics I think that we have uh, for people as we start to uh, get through the latter weeks of winter is uh, the escape on a yearly basis of the Home and Garden Showcase. And, of course, we've been telling you the last few weeks about the big event coming up in just a few days. We have a very special guest today who's going to be talking with us about that. I know him because, well, when I was younger, I used to be what's called a motorhead. Uh, and uh, I like fast automobiles and, and automobiles of different uh, stripes. He not only has a background in uh, driving some of the finest automobiles in the world, but he also has a carpentry background. And uh, you may know him from uh, television also from uh, his efforts there, as well as uh, when he was on a, a program some years ago called Top Gear. And uh, he, uh, I appreciate people who can work with their hands. You're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Top Story with Bill Colley. And we're joined this morning by Eric Stromer. First of all, welcome to the program, sir. Hey, Bill, how are you? Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, right off the top, you know, t the tr transition in your life to, to go from uh, driving some high-performance automobiles to doing a program about carpentry uh, tells me that, uh, what, what do they call you, a renaissance man, something along those lines? I think it's it, uh, probably more like a jerk of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one do you, you find more pleasure in? Well, I I was really a, a, a contractor first. I I started kind of doing like handyman stuff to get through college, and then you know I I had a, a an ill fated acting career for about three weeks where I got a job on a soap opera, and then I was tragically killed in a styrofoam boulder earthquake. So <laughs> and, and when that happened, you quickly have to find something to do, and I had a little bit of background and experience, so. I really started getting heavily into the, the remodeling business in Los Angeles. And from there, I, I, I uh, sort of fell into the TV world. You know, it didn't exist about 10 or 12 years ago. And then all of a sudden, there was this glut of TV shows that had to do with home improvement. And I was lucky enough to be one of the guys that get cast in one of those. Tell, tell folks a little bit about the program. Yeah, so the first thing I did was a show called Clean Sweep, which was on TLC, and it was an organizational design show. And we would basically go into people's homes and find the source of the horrible clutter and the hoarding that these guys were doing. And we would take all their stuff out, do a garage sale, and, I, and sell the stuff that was no longer useful and teach people how to sort of manage the you know, overwhelming amount of stuff we, we as Americans seem to collect in our homes. And then my job was to build these storage solutions for them. And, you know, we did over 120 episodes on that show, and I really saw some amazing stuff in terms of, you know, people having way too much junk. So that was kind of an informative thing for me to realize that was sort of a, you know, pervasive element, especially with these big box stores. You know, they everybody sort of wants us to go out and buy 500 rolls of paper towels at the same time. And that's great and less expensive, but let's face it, houses are smaller and we run out of space as we get more people in the in the family and so forth. And so, you know, it's kind of a big problem. So I, I found that to be pretty interesting, and I learned a qu quite a bit about how to deal with that. I was going to say uh, uh, the ability to actually have, and I think maybe most people maybe missed the boat if they didn't take a, a shop a class or two when they were in high school, or I should have listened to my dad more who could do a lot of these different things, and he, he had an ability around the house that was just – Incredible. He could build a home. Uh, he could use the heavy equipment, you know, for the ex excavation, build the foundation. He could wire the house. He could do the plumbing. He could roof the house. He could hang the ceilings. We don't have a lot of that uh, going on anymore. But this is really, if you can do these things, even the smaller chores, is a big household savings, right? Bill, I got to tell you, that's a really good point. You know, I've been doing a lot of speaking around the country the last few years. And 
you know, a lot, lot, lot of builders conferences, and they talk about the millennials and how there really isn't a, a, a labor pool to pull from right now. And, and as the economy is expanding and building is up a bit, nobody can find skilled laborers out there. They're just not there. So they're having to rely on old sort of, uh, you know, training programs like we used to have in shop class. Like, you know, I, I, I learned from a guy named Mr. Heavner that, you know, was missing his index finger because unfortunately he might've cut it off in the table saw or something. But, you know, those salty characters that taught us all how to do those things back in high school really aren't even there. Those budgets have been cut and that's not even a part of school anymore. So, you know, it really, if you do have, you know, half a brain and, and, and a desire to make a couple of bucks, you can really start to do well again in construction. I do have to tell you that I was a, a big fan of the, the Top Gear program. However, uh, I think what it, it maybe maybe it didn't work quite as well as what the BBC does because I think that Jeremy fellow on that version is always soused. But you, you guys were maybe just a little too clean cut for what you were doing. Yeah, now, now that was an interesting job for me because that show to me is iconic. And, and when they cast me in it, I felt like it would be the same as trying to replace Captain Kirk on the original Star Trek. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, I mean, these guys have got this really amazing brand. So, you know, we, we did a version. I did a version with Adam Carolla and a guy named Tanner Faust, and it, NBC did it, and, and it didn't work out because it was right at the time when, you know, the, uh, the energy, you know, the part of our business that was expanding with energy just tanked, right? So no one wanted to touch the show, but it did go on to, to air on a different network with different guys. So I was sort of right in the middle of regimes, unfortunately, and the, our American version didn't work. So I did get to drive some amazing cars. So. <laughs> well, Eric Strummer, I want to thank you for taking some time with us. Good luck this weekend, too. Yeah, I can't wait to meet you guys there in, uh, in Idaho. I've never been to Idaho, so please come and, and uh, let's talk about all things design, home improvement. Uh, I can help you with some of the questions you might have around your home. And thank, thank you, Bill. I appreciate everything. All right, super, and thank you. Now, see, now there's some music that would have been appropriate for Top Gear. Yeah, get, uh, get to James Garner's old... Uh, Rockford Files Camaro out and spin around in that one for a while. That was the dream car for just about everybody I was in high school with. Although, for me, it was really more of a 66 Barracuda. But other guys, they all wanted Camaros or Mustangs. 944, Bill Colley with you this morning. I want to thank Eric Stromer for taking some time out from his busy schedule. He actually still is uh, on the radio on a regular basis with uh, Adam Carolla because they did uh, the Top Gear show together. And, uh, and now they do some radio together in, uh, in California. So uh, he's, he's a very talented guy, but as we pointed out, he actually knows how to work with his hands and, and work around the house and carpentry jobs and things like that. And as he pointed out, it, it could save you a lot of money if you could do this work on your own without always having to turn to a contractor. We do remind people that the Home and Garden Showcase, of course, is coming up this weekend, and we have four prizes valued at $1,000 each. I think that Dr. Evil would say it that way. If you win, you pick the prize you like best. $1,000 towards ABC Seamless Gutters, ABC The Siding Without the Quacks. Also, you could have the choice of a Green Mountain Daniel Boone Grill from Brissy Heating and Air Conditioning. It includes a digital control, a meat probe, peaked lid for chicken, large fowl, and two bags of pellets. A friend of mine in North Carolina, went to high school with her, was telling me that over the weekend, when the, the big wind came up, and in the eastern part of the country, she said she has one of these out on her porch, and she said the wind moved it from one end to the other. Glad we're not living there at the moment. Uh, number three would be a weekend getaway to Seattle for two from New View Glass. Round trip air for two and a two-night stay at the four-star Edgewater Inn. And number four, or a $1,000 custom vanity from Premier Woodworking. See how their custom LED lighting can change the beauty and function of your kitchen at the Home and Garden Show. See them at the Home and Garden Show and learn to maximize space efficiency in your kitchen with the team at Premier. And you can enter to win at our website, newsradio1310.com. Also, very quickly, too, want to remind you, tomorrow I have some guests coming by from Western States Bus Services. And they're hiring part-time bus drivers right now. Split shifts five days per week, summer's off, and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. 
Apply today by contacting 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. We're going to wrap up in just a few minutes right after Mike Huckabee with the Huckabee Report, but very quickly. Big story going on all around the world, and we talked about it yesterday on air as well with U.S. Senator Mike Crapo. World War III, and I don't think we're, we're, we're understating this or overstating it, but World War III may be on the cusp with what's going on right now in North Africa and the Middle East. And there may be no way for the United States and Western Europe to stay out of it. And I'm, I'm bringing up the fact that you've got terrorist organizations, which are openly Chris Matthews, who has been a sycophant of President Obama's for years, went on TV last night on his program on MSDNC and said that the United States should be humiliated by what's going on over there. In other words, he thinks it's time to take some action. Just before I went to bed last night, I saw this on Facebook. I follow Franklin Graham, who, uh, who comes from, I think, one of the most wonderful families you'll ever find. And he says, the militant Islamic terrorist group ISIS has released a video called A Message Signed with Blood to the Nation of the Cross, showing the beheadings of 21 Egyptian Christians who had been kidnapped in Libya. And he writes, can you imagine the outcry if 21 Muslims had been beheaded by Christians? Where is the universal condemnation, he writes, by Muslim leaders around the world? He says, as we mourn with the families of those 21 martyrs, we'd better take this warning seriously, as these acts of terror will only spread throughout Europe and the United States. He says, if this concerns you like it does me, share this. The storm is coming. That from the Reverend Franklin Graham. And if you don't know who he is, he just crawled out from under a rock. His father, Billy Graham, of course, has been on the evangelical circuit for a little over 60 years now. And, and the family very prominent in those efforts. Peace-loving people, but I think that they've had enough. And I, I saw another post today from Reverend uh, Dwight Longenecker, who comes from a Roman Catholic perspective, and he's addressing the same issue. And he said, look, this is not going to be a crusade in the sense that Christians are going to be going out and fighting these people, because he said, you do have some Muslims around the world, and I know it's tough to say that there are good Muslims, but the King of Jordan, King Abdullah, is a Muslim, and this fellow Sisi, who's running Egypt right now, he may not be a, a popular fellow among the lefties running Washington, but again, he, he is taking an effort to stamp out this problem, and problem is really an understatement. These are good people who are trying to do the right thing. And uh, Reverend Longnecker says in his post today, he says, we should acknowledge that we have to work with these people, especially if they're supportive of our cause. So he said, governments must step up and do the right thing. And we are now seeing what's going on and their recruiting projects. And I had some people tell me on a website Saturday, this is not an important issue. This is a distraction from what's really going on. No, Washington wants you to be distracted from it. But if you saw the video of the Jewish man walking around France the other day, being spat upon and having his life threatened and people threatening to turn dogs on him, it's coming to a country near you. It really is. And if we don't take it seriously, we're going to, we're going to regret it when it comes to our children and our grandchildren. It's time, my friends. We can't avoid it. We didn't finish the job in the last 10 years. We've got to do it now. Huckabee is up next. Brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls. The telephone number is 736-6563. He referenced uh, Louis Jordan, who passed away at, uh, what was it, the age of, that of course was a stage name. He, his actual given name was slightly different than that. 93 years old. When I was reading the obituary yesterday, it mentioned that he had been married to the same woman for about 65 years. And she had passed away a year ago. You don't see that in a lot of those entertainment marriages. And I thought to myself, he played this uh, leading man who was a womanizer in many movies, but in real life, he went home every night to the same woman. And uh, you got to respect that. Coming up on, uh, well, almost 10 o'clock, about five minutes away, we'll have news, of course, from Fox. Rush Limbaugh will be along from uh, 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock. Sean Hannity after 1 o'clock news this afternoon and Glenn Beck. After the four o'clock news, right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX. You're also listening to News Radio 1310.com online, and that means you can hear us anywhere around the world. 29 at our studios at 955. 
quickly. This is an update from the story we led with at 8 o'clock this morning. The judge's decision slapping down the efforts of the Obama administration to wave a fig leaf and grant amnesty to tens of millions of people who are here in this country illegally. An undocumented bank withdrawal is still a robbery. An undocumented drug purchase is still a crack purchase. So this notion that, oh, undocumented. No, when you came here and you knowingly broke the law, you were here illegally. But a friend of mine says, the ruling is important in this sense. He writes me and says, it is the law, not the interpretation or implementation of the law that is supreme. There you go. Again, we are a nation of laws and not men. We are not ruled by fiat. We are not ruled by a king or an emperor. We are ruled by laws. And he says, he references something called 16th American Jurisprudence 256, a regulation that has the appearance of legitimacy but contradicts the actual law, is an unconstitutional law, and is null and void. And he writes, in fact, you have a duty to disobey such regulations or rules or become an unwitting co-conspirator. And he says, the judge made the exact call when he ruled against Department of Homeland Security and the Obama administration for this, uh, this end-around attempt at amnesty, which the Obama administration is now trying to appeal. Wait until they lose the, uh, the, the, the case on uh, Obamacare as well. It's all going to come crashing down, and appropriately so, I think, in this situation. I had a caller earlier, and uh, I, I was talking with someone off-air about it. A fellow called me and wanted to give me some grief about all of this, saying, your facts are wrong. And then he gets angry with me because I give him a hard time. It's a bit like the hockey player skating up next to his opponent and just keep bumping him along the boards instead of just trying to put him through the boards. You throw a guy off his game. But if people would call me and say, I disagree with you, I think there's a, a point we need to make here, and it's different than what you're talking about. I'm more than happy to take the call. But when someone calls me up and says, you're wrong, or, you know, you're an idiot, and today it was just simply you're wrong. All right, you know, right off the top, you're not going to get a very good hearing with me. But if you called up and said, I have a different perspective, or I beg to differ with you, then I might be willing to listen. And then when a caller tells me to shove it up my butt, as he did, uh, he's not going to get a hearing whatsoever. Just my viewpoint on all of this. The problem when you're dealing with Mr. Liberal is Mr. Liberal thinks he's the smartest guy in any room. Lefty walks into, Lefty thinks Lefty is the smartest person there. And Lefty is so condescending that it just at, at some point they just don't understand. They're the worst kind of party guest. And I don't mind every now and then giving them a little business myself because of that. 9.58. As I said, Rush Limbaugh is coming up. 29 right now, looking for a high around 50 degrees before the day is over with. By uh, Thursday, in fact, as early as Thursday, we may be into the 60s. Something to look forward to. Limbaugh following news from Fox in just a, a matter of minutes. Right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Uh, there you go. My name is Bill Colley, and God willing, and the creek don't rise. I am back in this chair with you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Hope to see you then.